Hello, and you are listening to Bill Murphy's Red Zone Podcast. I interview leaders who inspire me in the areas of exponential technologies, business innovation, entrepreneurship, thought leadership, enterprise IT security, neuroscience, philosophy, personal development, and more. Welcome to the show. Welcome back to the show, everybody. This is Bill Murphy, your host of the Red Zone Podcast. Now, my day-to-day job is defense with enterprise IT security. However, I've got to tell you a story that two meetings that I've had recently. One was with a CIO who started with a company that I've known for 18 years or so when that business was 30 employees. Now that business has over 800 employees. And I had lunch with them. And we're talking, and uh, but he's an A plus guy. I mean, just very plugged in to growth, to growing as a human being, growing as a CIO. He mentioned a couple of his challenges he's having, and I said, "Have you looked into VR for some of your scientists for for a training point of view?" And he goes, "Ah, I hadn't thought about that. I had kind of uh, poo pooed that as an approach, but yeah, I gotta consider. I, I have to think about that. That's a good idea, Bill." And then the other story I have for you is. A CIO that I met with this previous week and much smaller organization, I'd say 120 employees, but the gentleman's been there for a while, eight years or so. And he said, you know, I'm very much wanting to support the culture of the organization from the founders. The founders have this vision of having a very inclusive culture, one that pulls people together. It's a very, very human centric and, but they have many diverse remote offices, I think 10 offices. And he was having a challenge pulling the message together for everybody. So he's using traditional videos and YouTube and training and conference meetings and things like that. And I said, have you looked at VR? And he said, no, we haven't looked at virtual reality. I I don't think that that would be for us. That's not something I think we would do. And it's interesting because I went back and met with the gentleman of the 800 person company. And I was talking to him two weeks later And I went by one of the guys, one of his lieutenant's offices, who really does a lot of the innovation testing for this particular CIO. And he had a, and I said, you know, what's that on your back? His name is Eugene. I said, what's that on your back? And he goes, oh, that's a VR backpack. I'm doing some testing. And I said, ah, he's doing VR testing. And so sure enough, that CIO, the one I had mentioned in my first story, had already started testing how he could apply VR at his organization. And the other gentleman did not. And he's not going to. And so I tell these two stories really, so you could ask yourself, which camp are you in? Both technologies apply. And and I'm not a VR expert, but I know the VR community. And I know where I can pull experts in if I need to. Because I've gone on meetup.com. I've gone to the meetups to see who the players are there. And I know the top three. So I could pull them in if I needed help in that domain. So today... You know, I want to just explore that so that you can think about that for yourselves. You know, are you the one who poo-poos the new technology and you're going to wait till it's here? Even though it's already here, you're going to wait till it disrupts you or potentially comes in and sideswipes you? Or can you dive in and really look at innovation of those technologies where you can really test them out? And so today's guest is Dr. Roman V. Yampolsky. He's a tenured associate professor in the Department of Computer Engineering and Computer Science at the Speed School of Engineering at the University of Louisville. He is the founding and current director of the Cybersecurity Lab and an author of many books, including Artificial Superintelligence, a futuristic approach. During his tenure at the University of Louisville, Dr. Yampolsky has been recognized as a distinguished teaching professor, professor of the year, faculty favorite, top four faculty, leader in engineering education, top 10 of online college professor of the year, and many other distinctions too numerous to mention. Dr. Yampolsky's main interest, areas of interest are AI, safety, artificial intelligence, behavior biometrics, cybersecurity, digital forensics, games, genetic algorithms, and pattern recognition. Dr. Yampolsky is the author of 100 publications, including multiple journal articles and books, 
His research has been cited by a thousand plus scientists and profiled in popular magazines, both American and foreign, like New Scientist, Poker Magazine. I never asked him about that, but that's interesting. <laughs> Poker Magazine, Science World Magazine, dozens of websites like BBC, MSNBC, Yahoo News, etc. And he's been featured 250 plus times in numerous media reports in 22 languages. What you learn in this episode is really to fine tune your understanding of AI from a safety point of view. So many times I brought on guests to talk about AI from an offensive point of view. This I would consider more defensive, more kind of deepening your appreciation and decision-making capabilities as it applies to AI with IT security, AI with AI safety. We discuss a couple concepts that are interesting and important. Why are heading or mental illness with machines? And I look at this as really misaligned incentives. So look at it from a sales rep point of view. If you ask a sales rep to sell more new customers, he may do that, but he might ignore profits. So now you have more customers, but less profit. Or you can tell your sales rep to sell more products, more tangible products, and possibly forsake the long-term relationship value of the customer because you're just trying to sell them products. So there are all sorts of misaligned incentives, and Roman makes this point with AIs. And I've even had this happen with my girls' soccer teams when I've incented them from the sideline and through practice to, to connect with each other from multiple passing. So I teach the girls how to move the ball. But if I have incented them at times so much for this that they've forgotten to score goals, that the actual object is to actually score goals. So misaligned incentives. And so with AI decision-making, this is important because AIs need to be able to explain themselves. And this is a deep area of research that Dr. Roman Yampolsky is doing is in this area of decision-making and really making sure we understand the decisions that AIs are making. The next is really the IT security implications of AI chatbots and social engineering attacks. Really fascinating conversation there. And the real danger of human level AGI, AGI stands for artificial general intelligence. And that's one of Roman's deeper concerns. And then how we're going to communicate with systems that are fundamentally going to be smarter than us, way smarter than us. For example, for when we communicate with a dog, we have these challenges communicating with a dog. We've got to go to trainers and learn how to train dogs. Well, what happens when AIs are smarter than us? What's that relationship with the AI to us going to be like? And he also talks about why we can't wait to develop AI safety mechanisms until there is an obvious problem. He said, we, and, and I thought back thinking that seatbelts in cars were a good idea the day the car was invented. So why did it take 60 years to develop seatbelts and mandate them? And his whole point is we can't wait for AI safety. We actually have to develop it. It's a good idea now. And also, finally, the difference between AI safety and cybersecurity. So very interesting conversation, deep conversation into AI from a defensive point of view. So there's no sponsor that I want to highlight from this episode, but I want to say that I would like to hear from you. My cell number is 410-320-6433. Again, that's 410-320-6433. Please text me or call me if you have guests you want to see on the show. If there's people that that I would be inspired to interview that you know that I would like in the areas that, that you've been listening to, like leadership, enterprise IT security, exponential technologies, innovation, personal development, people on the frontier of human performance, let me know. Call me or text me or just email me. If you want to go back and forth with me regarding a topic of interest, just email me at billm at redzonetech.net. Again, that's billm at redzonetech.net. I'm also active on Twitter at EXO IT Leader. That stands for Exponential Organization IT Leader. Again, EXO IT Leader on Twitter. It can be the Sahara Desert without feedback from you. So step out of the shadows and engage with me. I'd love it. Thanks again for listening, and I appreciate your attention today. Now let's get into my discussion with Dr. Roman Yampolsky. Well, Roman, I want to uh, welcome you to the show today. Thank you so much, Bill. So you recently wrote this book called Artificial Superintelligence. And can you take our audience back to what 
was the genesis of this of this book? Like, where did the seed initially germinate that you're like, I have to write this book? Right. So I do a lot of research on AI safety, and it's mostly published in scientific venues, conferences, journals. And I realize most people would never read a technical paper. So the best uh, idea I had for introducing more people to the concerns I had about artificial intelligence was through publishing a popular book. You wanted to reach a a large audience with your message, which is great because it's quite easy to talk about the benefits of artificial intelligence, but I love that your lens is on safety. Where do you like to start safety discussions? Like if I asked you, what is artificial intelligence safety? Where would you start me? So we can distinguish short-term and long-term concerns. Short-term, we worry about, you know, the type of decisions the systems are making today, whatever it's credit reviews or employment decisions. So we want to make sure they don't have any bias, not racist, not sexist, basically not repeating the mistakes uh, humans are making. Long-term, there is really no limit to concerns we have. The systems will control most of our infrastructure, will have impact on every aspect of our life. So it's very important to make sure we fully understand how they operate and uh, still remain in control. It's really interesting is that I was having a conversation with my CTO yesterday and we're leveraging this cloud service for our, our customers. We're leveraging this cloud, very advanced security analytics organization to do a lot of heavy lifting. However, they're not, they're really notifying, they're not taking action. So which is fine. The notification is super helpful. But when we got to get down to the customer level, we actually need to go do something about what they found. And so we've written some algorithms and tools, scripts that really automate the ability to go and actually affect an action from this super intelligent service. And that action is really an algorithm of sorts. It's really an intelligent way to slice through the data and take action. But I said to I see too, I said, it's very, very important that we programmatically know what this tool is doing and that it talked to us as a human and so that we know what was happening. So maybe that's a superficial way of of talking about artificial intelligence, but what would happen if we program AI and we don't know what it's doing next? Like it's it's not talking back to us. What, What happens? So that's actually a very common approach. We have those deep neural networks, which are just black boxes. We don't understand how they make their decisions. We just measure accuracy of a final decision. But it's very important to also be able to understand how they got there. Can they justify this decision, let's say, in a medical domain, right? So the system says, okay, you have cancer, this is a treatment. But how do I know it's correct? What is the evidence for that decision? So it remains a very open area of research, trying to get explanations out of those pattern recognizers. So one of the stories was interesting in your book. I'm going to read it because then I want to use the technical word around what it's called. Maybe we could talk about this a little bit, but this is going to be illustrating one of the problems with AI that you highlight. So you tell this story about a married couple, both 60 years old, were celebrating their 35th anniversary. During their party, a fairy appeared to congratulate them and grant them a wish. The couple discussed their options and agreed on a wish. The husband voiced their desire. I wish I had a wife 30 years younger than me. So the fairy picked up her wand and poof, the husband was 90. (laughs) So realizing the dangers presented by... So this is one of the things you're talking about, literal wish granting, which I guess is called, the more technical word is perverse instantiation. Maybe you can just kind of give, that's one one story, but maybe you can give us another, maybe tell us more about this. All right. So human language is very ambiguous in general. And a lot of times we don't take uh, what is being said literally. We understand much deeper what is meant and what would make our conversation partner happy. Whereas machines don't have the same common sense. They don't have the same background. So that's very easy for them to misinterpret given situation. For any command for any desire you'll express. There are multiple ways of getting there. And maybe the final result is the same, but how you got there is different. Or maybe even the actual final state is very different because there are multiple ways of interpreting what is being said. And there are many, many examples of doing that. Can you give us another another one? Sure. So a common example would be, okay, I created this super intelligent system. I'll 
ask uh, for happiness. I want to be happy. I want everyone to be happy. As people, we kind of understand what that means. We want to be healthy, wealthy, beautiful, all sorts of desirable properties. But there are other ways of accomplishing that. For example, drugs is a very simple way of getting to happiness quickly. Oh, I see. So the conversation about what makes someone happy, the literal interpretation for the computer might be take drugs because they're not going to know the, the subtle nuance. Exactly. So as a person, you understood. I didn't mean, okay, get me so high, I can't really do anything about it. But to a machine, it would be a perfectly reasonable approach to get to the same state. Now, people are thinking about this now, right? I mean, it looks like you've referenced in 2006, the open source WISH project. What is that? Obviously, people are thinking about these concepts well before today. So today it is a very hot area of research in AI safety, human value learning, trying to understand how humans value certain things and express them. The citation to the Open Wish project, that was not really AI research, that was more of a philosophical, I guess, discussion of nuances in really dealing with genies and granting wishes. But the parallels are very good between this powerful genie, mythological creature, and super intelligence system. In both cases, you want to be very careful about what you wish for. There is also parallels with religion. We're always saying, okay, if God wants to punish you, he'll give you exactly what you ask for. So what you're saying is that people are researching use of language for extreme clarity. Is that one way of saying it? Right, but we understand we can never get to that level with human language. Programming languages, yes, we can be very precise. With human language, we'll always have this ambiguity, this fuzziness. So we really need machines which can work with that. It doesn't confuse them. They understand, okay, when you said I want a hot girl, you don't mean someone with fever. <laughs> well, that's interesting because I, I know that in picking for immortality, one of the quotes was, I wish to live a location of my choice in a physically healthy, uninjured, apparently normal version of my current body containing my current mental state, a body which will heal from all injuries at the rate of three sigmas faster than the average given the medical technology available to me. So that's what brought up my point of comment about clarity. Are, are we going to need to really rethink how machines are going to interface with humans? How do we handle this programmatically? Absolutely. So just communicating. How do you communicate with something which is so much smarter than you? So we have hard time communicating with animals, for example. Supposedly we're smarter than dogs, but we're really not doing well communicating both ways. Now think about something with IQ of a thousand equivalent, right? How do you communicate with something like that? What they say or try to communicate may be too complex for us to get, and what we say may be too ambiguous, too fuzzy for them to implement correctly, even if they wish to do so. One of the points that stuck out for me in your book and in the research and the point, this, this is a high level point that I think most we need to understand is that human beings are not infallible, of course. And I guess someone's trying to measure our infallibility rate. But even if a super intelligent machine, when it, and I'm highly paraphrasing, so I'm looking forward to your comments on this. So if a machine is making X number of million decisions a second or every five seconds or every 10 seconds. And they're not going to be infallible either. In fact, even if they were smarter than humans, mathematically, you were saying that even if they're 99% accurate with potentially tens of millions of decisions that are being made, there's going to be a lot of errors. Right. And if the system has a lot of impact, even the tiniest of errors, very small percentage of errors after they accumulate would have tremendous impact on society. If that machine controls infrastructure, if it controls economy, even if it's wrong, you know, once every million decisions, billion decisions, that's hundreds of wrong decisions every day. So how do you, when you're talking and educating people that are in decision-making capacities within organizations, whether they be governmental or an enterprise, what's a good counsel for them regarding bringing in AIs into their organization? Like, what is a good question that they should be asking themselves and asking vendors when they're bringing these tools in? Well, of course, we need to understand what the technology is and how it works. It shouldn't be this magical black box where they assume it's an oracle with perfect knowledge. Also, I always suggest that 
really important decisions, things like who lives or dies, should never be left up to the machine. There is always a human in the loop who makes the final decision. Once you surrender that control, there is really no way to get it back. We already see we surrendered control in terms of complicated domains, things like stock markets, nuclear power plants. All that is controlled by software now, and there is no way to undo it. Okay, so making sure you understand what is in the black box and not surrendering control. What does that mean? Does that mean that the black box has to report back to you? Is essentially So you're strong into the safety side. So what would that black box give you from a safety signal point of view? So it should be able to explain how it makes its decisions at a level a human would understand. It cannot be oversimplified, like we talk to children, we'll tell them something not quite correct, but simple enough for them to understand. That's not good enough to truly evaluate if uh, the decision is a correct one. So it has to be able to explain its decisions, and we should be able to verify it. And if there is any possibility that it's wrong, we should be able to detect it and override that decision. I had a guest on recently who said that he thought that AIs were going to be teaching AIs that there was going to be an AI that would sort of be the exemplar of human values or whatever those may be in that particular domain. And it would be teaching the AI or sort of be a governor. Do you believe that that's possible? So agreeing on values is already a very difficult problem. We've been trying to do it for thousands of years in philosophy and we've failed. I don't think anyone any two people would agree 100% on anything. And what's worse, once we transfer it to machines, now again, you're talking about something capable of enforcing that set of values on all of humanity, at least in long term. So that's going to create problems. Having one AI monitor another AI doesn't really solve any problem. It just transfers the problem to a different function within the program. It's not making it easier. In fact, it creates additional levels of uh, communication which might cause additional problems. So I don't see it as a solution, this idea for AI governor or AI ethical control system. It doesn't seem like as a separate piece it adds anything. This seems to be moving faster than we're going to be able to govern. And I I wonder if when you think about this problem from an AI safety If there's no time to govern and and set up controls because the technology is moving into our infrastructure as we speak prior to laws and, and, and governance structures or frameworks or protocols or acceptable use, et cetera, how do you approach that problem? Like, How do you think about something after the horses have been let out of the corral? That's the problem. So we have this exponential technology. AI is growing at that rate. But everything in terms of control, whatever it's political or legal aspects, at best is linear, maybe slower than that. We don't have solutions. We don't have AI safety mechanisms, and no one even knows how to get there. It's very easy to see that creating a safe AI is harder than just creating any AI. We've been trying to do it for 60 years at least, trying to create intelligent machines. So far, we didn't get there. So I'm suspecting it will take at least that long or longer to make an AI safety mechanism, which is not very encouraging given predictions and when we're going to get to human level intelligence. What's interesting about one of your chapters is called wireheading in machines. And that was a new concept for me. And if you were running a a lecture in your university for new students, like it's a 101 class to introduction to, to exponentials and you were covering AI as one of your topics. How would you explain wireheading, addiction, and mental illness in machines? That was the topic that was super interesting. Right. So it's exactly what you think it is in humans. So you know how mental illness works. You know addiction. We're addicted to drugs, addicted to maybe pornography, all sorts of pleasure-driven stimuli. And machines are subject to the same problem, especially the ones which are based on reinforcement learning. If there is a reward being given by a human or coming from an environment, a lot of times it's easier to go directly for the reward instead of trying to do productive behavior. So the system may try to steal the reward, influence human programmer to provide additional reward, basically what we see with drug addicts. Okay. Have you seen this happen yet? Basically machine gone awry or uh, have you seen examples of this? 
So obviously machines today are not at a human level performance, but then we do evolutionary computation or those rewards based algorithms. We do see this sometimes where the system is not really interested in accomplishing the goals of a programmer, but it just wants to collect as much reward as possible. So maybe I'm training a system to, I don't know, play soccer or something like that, right? And there are reward points given for certain behaviors. Maybe controlling the ball gives you a certain number of points. The goal, of course, is to teach the system to play soccer, to score goals and so on. But all it does is really just grabbing the ball and running around with it because that's where the points are. You know, it seems to me that you'd almost because of the spiraling of this out of the governance control, it almost seems to be very useful to learn how to harness that AIs to solve certain really hard problems that are beyond the human mind to solve like this one of them. So, so maybe it would be domain specific, like uh, infrastructure of nuclear plants, and the machine could be assigned to actually figure out the vulnerabilities assigned to that specific narrow domain and, and keep working on a domain by domain, and getting smarter and smarter with the intelligence so that it becomes almost it's assigned to this to the safety side. Is that possible? Is that just a theoretical burp on my part? Or how would you approach it? Well, we're definitely using AI as a tool to help us in many individual domains. Cybersecurity is a great example. We use machine learning to identify attacks, to discover new attacks. That's definitely the case. But there is a fundamental difference between narrow AI, something which is one domain only expert, and a general AI, something capable of knowledge transfer, capable of succeeding in multiple domains. And I really see the danger is coming mostly from this uh, general intelligence. And uh, so far, we don't know how to do that, luckily. It may be that in 20 years, 30 years, we'll get there. But right now, we're really only dealing with narrow domain AIs. And while they fail, and I have a recent paper describing exactly how they fail and what we predict they're going to fail at, the damage is limited to that one domain. We don't have cross-domain problems yet. So that's a good thing. You said AGI, Artificial General Intelligence. And what would that look like if, first of all, when would you see that happening? And then what would it look like like in a day-to-day life of a human being that is a Westerner, it's educated, how would they experience AGI from a first level? And, and, and I know I've seen some of those slide presentations where artificial intelligence reaches the intelligence of a mouse and then of a village idiot. And then shortly after reaching the intelligence of a village idiot, it's super beyond that. So maybe you can kind of jump in there and say, where would AGI fit in? Right. So that goes back to this concept of singularity. Once you get to human level intelligence in domains like engineering and science, the system is very quick to improve itself, upgrade itself, do original research in robotics and AI. And so very quickly, it goes beyond just human level. It becomes super intelligent. And at that point, Any predictions we make are really meaningless. We can't predict behavior of such a system, how it's going to impact us. In short term, before we get to AGI, yeah, we can talk about technological unemployment. We can talk about, you know, things related to labor automation and so on. But long term with uh, superhuman performance, we just don't fully understand what to expect. And as you look at not knowing what to expect, how do you incrementally try to put layers of protection into this problem? Are, are you in your research trying to focus on the end game or, for example, like an AI chatbot right now that's, that an enterprise is using or experimenting with? Would you tear into that and really look at and research that and where it could go and how it could go awry? Or are you th- more just dealing with the general theory 20, 30, 40 years down the road? So both are very interesting. We want to make sure technology we have today is safe and our safety mechanisms are keeping up with it. So maybe for chatbots, we've seen examples of them becoming verbally abusive. So maybe I'll have filters in place to make sure that doesn't happen. But obviously (laughs) the damage is limited. Somebody will have hurt feelings, but that's about it. Long term, the consequences are much more significant. I'm not sure there is actually a solution. I can say that I think it's possible to control a super intelligent system. So what I'm looking at is a lot of tools which allow us to have more time to figure it out. Ways to contain such projects, to study such systems. But all of it, as far as I can tell, is just temporary solutions. They are not uh, really guaranteed to work long term. 
tell me about some of the containment. Let's just give uh, an example or two about some of the containment tools, because that's super practical. And I'd love to hear how you're approaching those right now. Right. So it's similar to how we study computer viruses. We have uh, computer systems which are not on a network, which are creating a sandbox, a virtual environment from which the process cannot communicate, cannot escape. And that's one of the projects I'm working on, developing this limited communication system, developing multiple layers of virtualization to make sure the system cannot escape and we can shut it off before it uh, manages to infiltrate multiple layers. It's still in early stages. Uh, We're still trying to get additional funding for it. We published a few papers and kind of general directions in it, but it's not uh, a finished product. But that would be contained, meaning it wouldn't necessarily have connectivity to the outside world, for example. It would just be something that you could a sandbox to contain and test in. Right, right. So it uh, prevents it from social engineering attacks, prevents it from sharing information with global community. In your books, maybe you could share with the audience, what is a social engineering attack from an AI point of view? So the easiest way to break into any system is not to actually find a technical flaw, but to find someone who's going to let you in, whatever it's a secretary, a janitor, just kind of talk them up into revealing a password or, you know, connecting a cable. And as those systems become better at uh, just talking to people, you talked about chatbots, it becomes easier and easier to gather information, to communicate, to maybe convince people to engage in certain behaviors. And with all the information about you available through your social media profile, it becomes very easy to create a very targeted attack to really get someone to do what you want. Yeah, because it's interesting now that social element or the human element is the biggest vulnerability point, whether that be just clicking on malware or hitting sites or hitting um, spam that's coming into the network. And it's, it's inadvertent. And so a lot of money is spent on training the human. So it's interesting, your point uh, on a chat bot that might have the intelligence level of a well, I don't even know where, where is the intelligence level of the chatbot right now? Is it 18, 19, 20? It's pretty low. I mean, most of them are just tricks and they don't really understand anything they're doing. So it's not so bad unless you're really talking to people who have no background in safety, security, computer science. And that's, of course, the problem. We see it with standard spam and phishing emails. Interestingly, even additional training doesn't seem to be very productive in reducing this type of danger. Have you seen some reports where that hasn't been as effective as I made the statement earlier? Right. So something like uh, spear phishing attacks, they would go to a company with maybe 100 employees and they run just like a spear phishing email campaign. Maybe, I don't know, 85 people would click on it. Okay. So they go in, we'll do a workshop, we'll explain to them, don't click on things, it's dangerous. They do it again. This time, maybe like 60 people click on it. They do it three, four, five times cycles, and still you have someone clicking on it. It never stops. <laughs> Where do you th- see the research going right now in creating safety mechanisms? So are you at the tip of the spear now, or do you, do you see uh, any glimmers of hope as far as helping really drive the engineering efforts in, in a certain direction where we, so we have a sort of a tide that rises all boats. Is there a, a certain research angle that's being explored that may be able to kind of elevate the security and the safety concerns from an engineering point of view? So luckily, there is a lot of interest now in a lot of projects taking place. Some are well-funded, really good researchers. The problem is, I'm not sure any of it is actually doable in practice. So theoretically, we can talk about trying to understand human values or maybe implementing some morals into machines. In reality, I'm not sure it would actually work. And uh, this is true of all similar projects. Projects on software verification have limits. There are limits to verifiability. Projects dealing with just explaining decisions by those systems. Again, there are limitations in terms of complexity a human can understand. So I don't think Today, anyone has even an idea for a working AI safety mechanism which would work long term to make a human level or higher intelligence safe. Yeah, very interesting. And, and I've had uh, different perspectives on this. Some people would say that I've had on, literally guests that have had on said, no, we're not concerned. We're going to figure this out as we go. And we're going to let the AIs teach us. But you have some significant concerns about this and they're, they're pretty vocal about these AI safety concerns and having machines teach us how to be safe. Maybe you could share one of those with us. 
So it's definitely the case that there is a lot of good people, experts who are what I would call AI risk skeptics or even denialists. And it's interesting because the arguments are usually either, well, machines will be good to us just because, or it will take thousands of years to be a problem. We don't have to worry about it. We'll get to it. Then it's a problem. So all those can be argued about. I published specifically on creating malevolent AI on purpose. Like people today design computer viruses, there is going to be the same trend to take intelligent software and give it malevolent goals. Now, there is no debate about it. I mean, I can always argue, I'll do it just to prove a point. And anyone who says it's not a problem, we don't have to worry about it, ignores this fact. Most problems will come from deliberate malevolent design. And it's the hardest problem to solve. It contains every other problem aspect. So poor design, mistakes in implementation, value alignment problems, all of them are part of this malevolent design issue. But uh, this also has additional negative payload. And anyone denying that this is a problem is wrong. They're ignoring evidence. Also saying, okay, we'll work on the safety mechanism when it's an actual problem. This cannot be done. It's too late at that point. It will take longer to design a safety mechanism than to design the actual system. It's like saying, okay, let's uh, make a car first and we'll worry about brakes when we're on a highway. Yeah, it's interesting. The uh, I had a guest on that was, we talked about autonomous vehicles and the reliance on GPS. But what happens if our satellite networks get taken out? What happens five, 10 years from now when we have a, a big chunk of the cars on the road or a larger chunk than today for sure are, are um, autonomous vehicles. What is the safety mechanism in place to run truly autonomously without having the guidance from the network? And it's a design challenge that we don't want to wait until that happens to architect around. And Microsoft ran into this problem. You know, they were first to market and we either came out with their code and they launched their code with Windows 95 and and moving through their technology stack. And then they, in 2002, I think they started, Bill Gates got so much flack, he doubled down and put a billion dollars into his security teams. And now they have a, quite a secure stack of software. Or I should say that they have a, a huge investment in, in security, but it happened after the fact. So we sort of have a history of doing uh, safety and security after the problems exist. Exactly. And I, I talk about it again in the recent paper, the difference between cybersecurity and AI safety. In cybersecurity, your goal is to minimize attacks. You want as few as possible, and you want to minimize damage. Okay, somebody's going to lose their social security numbers, maybe a few bank accounts will be taking over, but the damage is limited. With AI safety, if you're talking about human-level intelligence system, there is no limit to damage. We really cannot say, okay, it's not going to cause human lives or destroy economy completely. So it's a very different uh, problem. We're not just trying to minimize number of AI failures. We need to get that number to zero, and it doesn't seem like it's actually possible. Artificial general intelligence, is it all pervasive across our networks, or are you envisioning it still being domain-specific? So, for example, is it just in a robot AGI, or is it in really, it pervades our algorithms, it pervades every technology we touch? It has potential to be everywhere, and it's really interesting how it changes a lot of our privacy notions. So things which uh, right now no one has time or energy to analyze, a system like that can go back, you know, 10 years, 20 years and put together all those different data points and discover things about uh, you and me, which uh, we didn't really anticipate. So we see it with our politicians today. You know, they go back and they find this video from 10 years ago of a guy saying something, but this is like manual labor and it's done on a scale of one. Think about a system capable of doing it for everyone and very quickly with all the data. It, very, very stunning. I've been reading this book recently on blockchain. Um, actually, uh, the gentleman is coming on the podcast and it's, could blockchain help in, in some regards, or do you think the AIs will be so smart at some point that they'll be actually able to crack into blockchain? So there will be, and, and I'm bringing this mainly up for privacy point of view, is sort of re recovering our sense of privacy from back from the pre-1980s era. Uh, do you see blockchain at all fitting into your models? 
So it's a tool. It's a cryptographic tool. Like any cryptography, it could be useful to increase security. Again, AI is not magic. If there is a computational barrier to decrypting data, it will be there. How we use it with AI is an interesting question. I mean, uh, depends on what you're trying to do with it. I think one of the pieces that is most interesting, and, and you and I have talked about this prior, is that the exponential technologies give us lots of benefits. And I think it's it's really incumbent upon really smart people like yourselves and myself who bring people like you onto the show, that the message is as much about governance as it is about how to ex- use this for positive benefit for humanity, businesses, personal, et cetera. And so one of the the blockchain pieces was actually one of the pieces that I, I really find appealing is the ability to recover privacy and in a sense of um, the ubiquity of the internet came with it a whole bunch of positives, but we lost the security and privacy. And so recovering that is what I really hoped that blockchain potentially could can help. And and it also dismantles the the middleman. And so it makes it very ubiquitous. So because you essentially can take out inter- intermediaries. And so when we talk about AI and, and we talk about blockchain, it's more the smarter these data aggregators are being able to pull data together about us. But then if we can take that data and actually um, obfuscate it again and actually make it private and make it, if I have a wallet that is specific for Bill Murphy and, I, and a certain part of my wallet I can give to Amazon, another part of that wallet I can give to the IRS, another part of it I can give to my employer so I don't have to give my entire identity. And possibly there's a way that AIs can help participate in a beneficial good related to that. So it's more taking the AI and saying, this thing's going to be so darn powerful, maybe it needs to figure out parts of these problems. But if the bad AI then comes in, it can actually break the blockchain, then we sort of back to where we started. So there are definitely benefits to this technology. My concern is that cryptocurrencies make it very easy for an AI which manages to get access to internet to get access to this financial resource, quickly accumulate it, and then be able to use that money to pay off people to do its bidding. We've seen people use uh, cryptocurrencies to hire killers to get access to additional server resources. So that's my concern. I'm always looking at the safety and security aspects of every technology. Yeah, but this is this is really important that this be done because it's almost like there's going to be a second arms race in, in some respects. As many people are looking to positively exploit the uses of these technologies, there's going to be the dark side of this as well. So it's uh, it's interesting your angles on this. So, what message would you and you know, as we wrap up our conversation, Roman? What message would you give our our audience that's again is made up of there's going to be entrepreneurs listening here, very technical folks, all the way up to the CIOs and sometimes board members that I are listening to the show to really see where the future is going. How would you guide them through their decision making? from more of a strategy point of view as they as they look at the world? So short term, especially with young people, with students, I always suggest before you commit to any degree, any major, see if it's going to be around in 10 years, 15 years, because a lot of it is automated, replaced. So if you're starting a new company, same logic applies. Is the product you're developing something which in 10 years will be done by machines automatically? Will you still have a competitive edge in that? In terms of uh, human level AI and beyond, there is really little we can do. An individual doesn't have much say in that issue. If you do get to participate in a political process, make sure your representatives are aware of those problems. We had some success with that. President Obama just last week talked about AI safety. So it's very encouraging to see that level of understanding from the White House. But we need to make sure they not just uh, know about it, they're willing to fund this type of research. No, that's excellent. That's excellent. And and how would people reach out to you regarding AI safety? Are you active on social? Where would you prefer to engage with people? Yeah, I'm always happy to engage. Facebook, Twitter always works really well. Just feel free to follow me on both. Oh, that's, that's excellent. We'll definitely put this on the show notes, Roman, so people can uh, reach out to you and, and listen and follow your work as, uh, as, as we go along here. And I very much appreciate uh, your hard work in these subjects and, and bringing uh, these concepts in to, and not concepts, these important issues to, to our awareness. Thank you so much for inviting me.
Well, I appreciate that. And until next time, Roman, thank you very much for coming on the show. Thank you, Bill. So there you have it. That was my conversation with Dr. Roman Yampolsky. I hope you enjoyed it. More deepening appreciation for AI and AI safety. And remember, please reach out to me. I'd love to hear from you. I want to understand who you want to see on the show as we wrap up 2016 and move into 17. I just want to know exactly who I would be inspired that you know about that I don't. So reach me on my cell phone at 410-320-6433. Again, that's 410-320-6433. Text me or you can get me at my email at Bill m at redzonetech.net, Bill m at redzonetech.net. I wish you the best and I appreciate you for your attention and for your listening and have a great rest of the day and I'll see you in the next episode. Bye-bye. So there you have it. This wraps another episode of Bill Murphy's Red Zone podcast. To get all the relevant show notes, please go to our blog at www.redzonetech.net forward slash podcast. Additionally, make sure you go to iTunes and leave your comments in iTunes about the show. This helps our show rankings enormously and it helps support the show. Until next time, I appreciate you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you.